Hi students, this week we will be discussing Susan Sontag's In Plato's Cave. And before we start, I want you to think a little bit about how you use photography. Um, you can look through your um, phone's camera roll and see the last five pictures you took and kind of think about how um, photography is a part of your life. So Susan Sontag um, was born in New York City in 1933. She died in 2004. She's a philosopher, novelist, filmmaker, and activist, and she's been called one of the most important critics of the 20th century. She wrote not just on photography, but also on interpretation, on metaphor and how we use illness as metaphor, and also on issues of empathy and how we um, relate to the pain of others. In the essay you read for today, she gives this really broad and multifaceted account of what photography is. In fact, she talks about photography in so many different ways. Um, I kind of struggled to figure out what points I wanted to highlight. And so I created four ways of um, articulating what she is doing with photography. She talks about it as a social practice, um, particularly ones um, that we participate in when we have families or when we're tourists. She talks about photography as having this sort of feeling of power and control, um, particularly from a distance. And we see this with surveillance and voyeurism and sort of um, the way that photography um, depicts and is kind of a metaphor for um, being a sexual predator. Um, she talks about photography as a medium for empathy and moral education, um, which is an important part of the essay is considering whether photography can kind of educate us and give us moral impulses. And then she um, talks about throughout the essay that um, photography is a consumer product that feeds image addiction. So that's going to be a huge part of um, how she kind of describes photography as a whole. So photography is a social practice. She describes it as a mass art that everyone sort of participates in. Everyone has a camera or most people have cameras and use them frequently. And it's part of our social rights. Um, we record our lives and share them with others. Um, we try to record our family and the growth and sort of connect to each other with cameras. Um, when we travel, uh, it would be weird not to bring a camera with or not to take photos of our travels. And really all of these different things have in common is they're trying to capture our experiences so we can share them, so we can memorialize what's important to us and hold on to that experience. So she describes this as kind of promoting a type of nostalgia. Phot um, photographs for her are memento mori, which means remember you will die. Um, it's a Victorian phrase. Um, in Latin, and it's this idea that, you know, your life will come to an end and all the things you hold dear will come to an end. And so you need to treasure and cherish the things around you. You need to treasure your life. And so photographs have that sort of quality. They um, participate in a person's mortality, vulnerability, and mutability. So when we have babies, um, we take tons and tons of photos of them. Um, children change a lot, especially when they're young. And so we um, try to sort of capture all these different moments of children's life, but there's a sort of melancholy behind that. Like this moment is fleeting and it's gonna change and this child's gonna grow up. Or um, I remember there's been a few times I've taken photographs with my grandmother, knowing that it might be the last time that I have a photograph with her. So there is this sort of nostalgia, there is this sort of wanting to hold on to something that's fleeting that comes with a photograph. And um, she says that we also sort of use photographs to have this idea of an imaginary possession of a past. Um, so we try to hold on to the past in a particular way. It helps us feel like we have possession of it. And the same thing is true with space. So she thinks we have an increased tendency to take photographs in spaces that are unfamiliar to us because it makes us feel like we possess that space. So the greater the insecurity, the more the desire to take a photo. And so she says that it makes sense that photography kind of develops in tandem with tourism. And um, they also kind of serve as this evidence that you had a particular experience or that you were in a particular place. She says that photographs will offer indisputable evidence that the trip was made, that the program was carried out, that fun was had. Um, so we want to show proof of our experiences with photographs. 
And she says, using a camera also on a vacation kind of appeases the sort of anxiety we have that we should be working. Um, I chose this photo from Awkward Family Photos of a dad with a huge camera and a huge camera pack resting on his cut, uh, little child in the stroller. Um, Cause this is how I think of my dad on family vacations. We would pile into this minivan and go to South Dakota. I grew up in Minnesota. So we went to exciting places <laughs> like Wisconsin Dells and, uh, the corn palace and one of the Dakotas. I don't remember where that was. Um, but my dad would be outfitted with all this camera gear. And it was sort of like, uh, you know, this task he had, and he rarely ever took off work. And so um, we didn't really go on a lot of vacations. But there's something about taking the photos, right, that make you feel like you're doing something. So she says that it's a friendly imitation of work that we do when we're on vacation. And she also mentions, so there's this tension in taking the photographs because you're taking the experience and converting it into an image or souvenir that you'll try to take with you. So she says that we use photographs as a way of certifying experience, but it's also a way of refusing it by limiting experience to a search for the photogenic and by converting whatever that experience is into some sort of image. And I have had this experience when I'm on a vacation, when I like am experiencing something really beautiful, but I can't get the right photo of it. Either my camera's not quite right, or I don't have the talent to capture it, or maybe there's something really special about that moment that is just not photogenic. Um, and so if we are always trying to capture the experience in a photograph, a lot sort of slips through the cracks, a lot gets missed. And so she says that travel becomes a strategy for accumulating uh, photographs. Uh, so traveling almost seems like we do it for the photographs rather than for the actual experiences that we're going to have. The second thing she talks about is that photography kind of feels like power and control. Um, and I picked this very controversial cover of Paper Magazine that Kim Kardashian did. Um, partly she was really unaware of the uh, very racist history that this image brought up. Um, so you can do research behind this image, but there's something very, um, this is imitating a particular pose um, of an African woman who was exploited by colonialists. Um, and particularly, um, it's taking up this sort of um, image in a way that's really deeply troubling if you care about racial injustice. So there's many ways that photographs kind of have this hidden aggression to them. She says that there's an aggression implicit in every use of the camera. There's something about a power relation that is always established with a camera. And um, she starts out kind of more innocently describing the power of photography. So we can use the word power in a way that's kind of ominous, like um, oppressing others. But we can also use power in a way that looks at um, the potential of what something can do. And she says that the most grandiose result of a photographic enterprise is to give us a sense that we can hold the whole world in our heads as an anthology of images. So this is what photo, um, photography kind of makes us feel, is if we feel powerful, like we can collect the world, that the world belongs to us, that we can turn it into an image and we can make it into an anthology for us to possess. So there's something about possession that comes with taking a photograph. And she says that photographs really are experience captured and a camera is the ideal arm of consciousness in its acquisitive mood. So um, when we're looking through a camera lens, when we're trying to, um, our, our viewfinder, when we're trying to capture the world or the experience, that's the acquisitiveness of our consciousness. Our consciousness seeks out, it's curious, and it likes to kind of grasp things and hold on to them. And the camera expresses that desire. And so she says to photograph is to appropriate the thing photographed. It means putting oneself into a certain relation to the world that feels like knowledge and therefore like power, right? So if I get something with my camera, I feel like I have grasped it, I can understand it, I have power over it. Um, I'm frequently taking photos of uh, leaves or insects or something that I don't know what it is to look at, uh, to look it up later. But there is something about 
almost like I'm collecting the world. I'm making my own little collection of things and um, having a sort of mastery over what I see through my use of my camera. She says that photographed images do not seem to be statements about the world so much as pieces of it, miniatures of reality that anyone can make or acquire, right? So I think of like collecting butterflies and pinning them up, right? And so I took something from the world and I rearranged it and I made it into an image, something I can hang up, something that I can collect and that's mine. And there's something kind of aggressive about that. It's a way of knowing the world, but it's also a way of asserting your power over the world. And um, I love this Instagram account called Influencers in the Wild. Um, this, it's just people posing, it's showing people taking videos and different photographs out in nature or in cities or just doing things that you would then post on Instagram. And it's funny because it kind of removes you because you're watching someone else take the photo. Um, and it just kind of reminds you of what sort of practices we have around philosophy. And there's something about being an influencer, right? It's this sort of power thing. Um, it's this privilege where your experiences, your point of view, your perspective, what you see and experience, and usually this is people with a lot of money who can travel and be in very luxurious apart, uh, hotels or um, cities or things like that. So you're sort of seeing this idealized world through their, um, through their pictures. Um, but it's sort of this expression of power um, and control, right? These are very controlled images. These are um, ways that we sort of assert that the world is ours. And then photography also, of course, is used as control, control because it ends up being evidence for things. Um, there's uh, surveillance has been around for a very long time. So Sontag's writing in the 70s and she's talking about the use of photography for surveillance. And this has become even more the case no matter where you are in public, there's cameras and there's face recognition and um, there's sort of everyday uses of it. So for example, every time I go to my friend's apartment, I you know type in the little key so I can get in, but it takes a picture of me and immediately emails it so that my friend receives this photo and can verify that this is me. So I, um, I yeah, so my pictures is constantly being taken. Um, and so is yours. Uh, <laughs> but there's this sort of idea that we can control things. If photography is evidence, if it allows us to see things and to track people, right? And there's this assumption that there's veracity there, that photographs have authority and that um, there is this relationship to truth. So if there's a photograph of it, the truth can be seen. And she's like, you know, there's a shady commerce between art and truth. This is not necessarily the case. So there's a lot of lies behind photography. Um, there's a lot of ways that photographs are formed in a particular way where you don't see the full story. You only see a sliver of the truth. And she also talks about photography in relation to voyeurism. And this is something that is talked about in film theory a lot, not just photography, but film theory, is that the camera lens kind of becomes this extension of the male gaze. Um, and it's like a distant gaze, but it's a controlling gaze. Um, so she talks about the movie Rear Window, where um, Jimmy Stewart plays a man who broke his leg, and he just has nothing to do except stare out his window. And he ends up seeing all sorts of things. Um, he's living in an apartment complex where everyone's window kind of faces him and he it's like he's looking at television like every window is a screen and so he kind of spies on things and it's a great thriller suspense movie um he witnesses something he shunned and um it kind of has to do with um looking but not being able to act right because he has this broken leg so it's this very interesting idea of what a camera does um what a camera allows and what a camera does not allow and photojournalism is a huge sort of part of this idea of kind of like we're all participants in voyeurism. Like what should we be allowed to see and what should we not be allowed to see? So a lot of times really terrifying images are published. Like this example of a woman and child falling from a fire escape. The woman did not survive this fall, the child did. And this was in the 1970s. It won a Pulitzer Prize and um, this happened in Boston. And as soon as it happened, they immediately put into effect a bunch of laws and policies 
um, to uh, make fire escapes more safe because they were trying to escape a fire and the fire department was there to rescue them when the fire escape fell apart. And so she plummeted to her death. And um, there was and still is, you know, criticism over whether someone's last moments of their life, whether someone in this sort of vulnerable situation, whether something, you know, um, your death is terrifying, whether that should be captured and allowed to be dissimulated in the media. So there's something too about standing there watching something like this happen and not acting. And in this case, she uses a bunch of examples of um, photojournalists from the Vietnam War who are recording things of people being killed and they're being, you know, they're watching something happen, but they're not participating. Um, and here, you know, it doesn't seem like this person could have saved her. Um, but at the same time, there's something about take, like being a bystander, watching something terrible happen and taking a photo of it, um, of all things. So this is the horror of photo photojournalism. She says it comes from the awareness of how plausible it has become in situations where the photographer has a choice between a photograph and a life to choose the photograph. The person who intervenes cannot record and the person who is recording cannot intervene. And later um, in another paragraph, she even says that there's almost this sort of implicit wanting that thing to continue because if it's photographable, if it's, you're trying to capture that moment, there's a part of you that desires for that to continue so that you can photograph it. So there's something um, perhaps unspoken that is quite um, cynical or um, that you're profiting off of some, someone's deep and intense suffering. So there were so many images um, in photojournalism I could have chosen from. Um, this is a Saigon execution. Um, the person, um, who photographed this, Eddie Adams, thought that he was just photographing an interrogation. So he was taking photos of this event, and then this man pulls out a gun and shoots him and kills him. And so he ended up photographing an execution, which he wasn't expecting. And again, this won a Pulitzer Prize. This was very influential. Um, Vietnam photography was more gruesome than any war photography people had seen before. Um, it was more intimate in a way. You see people up close, you see people right before they're dying, you see people in the act of dying, which hadn't been portrayed a lot before. And it really influenced public opinion on Vietnam. Um, it really mobilized um, political um, opinion. And it changed our relationship to war in so many ways. And um, this is something that Sontag talks about too, is that you know the Korean War was not shot in the same way as the um, Vietnam War. So um, we can kind of see the effects of these photos, but there's something about them that um, even, it's not just that the act is violent, it's that capturing this act, capturing this moment of a person's life seems to be violent in a particular way. Um, this is another important um, photograph um, from Vietnam. This is a Buddhist monk protesting the treatment of Buddhists. Um, by self-immolating, by turning, you know, setting himself on fire and martyring, uh, martyring himself um, for his religion. And um, I put the link um, here so you can look this up. Um, 100 photostimecom um, gives you a bunch of background and historical information about some of these very famous photographs. Um, but again, you have this sense if you're looking at this that something terrible is happening and you're this sort of passive, um, bystander watching it happen. And um, when we're talking about sort of power and control, we can talk about violence and we can also talk about sex, right? So um, in terms of sex, um, she talks about the photographer Diane Arbus, who's, um, these are some of her photographs from the 1960s. And um, Arbus was really known for these intimate um, sort of portraits of people and particularly kind of naughty ones, either a topless dancer or a drag, a man in drag or something like that. And she always, that's what attracted um, Arbus to photography, she says, is she liked that it was naughty. She liked that it made her feel perverse. Um, so there's something about um, photography that allows us to kind of explore sexuality, um, something feels naughty about it, like it's a violation of some sort. 
And this um, gets portrayed, there's so many movies, so I'm looking at the movies that um, Sontag is talking about, but there's even more recent movies. I think Nightcrawler is one of them. I'm, I'm trying to think. There's like a lot of movies about people who have kind of um, a predatory sort of relationship to women and that's um, expressed through photography and through murder. Those things are very closely connected um, in a number of movies. So she uses the example of Blow Up, which is a 1966 movie. And she kind of talks about that. One of the things this movie shows is that using a camera is not actually the same thing as having sex with someone. And it's not even the same thing as like sexually violating someone physically because it always involves some sort of distance. And that's why the image of the voyeur, right? Someone spying on someone else, someone um, sort of experiencing sexual desire um, and fulfilling that through vision and not touch is the sort of image that she uses. Is a, uh, Being a photographer creates distance, but of course distance can be something that people find very sexually appealing. Um, it's, uh, can, distance can be a form of control. Um, not just sort of having your hands on someone. So she talks about photography as desire from a distance because um, we also, she talks about, you know, someone who has a photo of their lover in their wallet or hanging a poster of a celebrity on your wall, like someone that you sexually desired. And so there's uh, something about the photograph being both a pseudo presence and a token of absence. Um, that's someone you can desire, but you never possess, right? Which is uh, a kind of fantasy. That's what sexual fantasy is, right? As soon as you fulfill that dream, as soon as you fulfill the fantasy, it's gone. It's, it evaporates. And so it's the fantasy, the fantasy remaining there um, requires distance from the object that you desire. And that's what a photograph gives us. A photograph gives us um, the image of what we desire, but not the possession of it, which keeps that keeps that desire there. And she says this makes a photograph like a talisman where you can sort of um, summon something from a distance, right? A talisman kind of having this magical power. And so we have a sentimentality if we have a picture of something or someone we desire. Um, and it's an attempt to contact or lay claim to another reality. So if I cover my house in pictures of Lizzo, like suppose I'm obsessed with Lizzo a little bit, right? So suppose that I have photos of her everywhere. Um, it might be that I'm conjuring a different reality around myself. I'm not living in my reality. I'm kind of living in one that's more beautiful and um, fuller, full of music and full of beauty. There's something about a photograph for Sontag that is always a violation. So this plays into control, this plays into sex, this plays into violence. It's a way of objectifying someone. So she says to photograph people is to violate them by seeing themselves as they never see themselves, by having knowledge of them they can never have. It turns people into objects that can be symbolically possessed. So that first statement, I'm sure you have thought before or you've met someone who maybe is really hesitant to have their photo taken and they can't quite put their finger on why, right? A lot of people hate the way they look in photos um, and some people love it, but you'll notice like a lot of people are more likely to post a selfie, something they took themselves where they can choose how they represent themselves and that gives them a little bit of possession of themselves. And it's different than having someone else take a photo of you. Um, there's something that feels like you're giving up your power, you're letting yourself be objectified when someone snaps a shot of you. Um, and she says that this is similar to a gun, right? A gun objectifies someone. Um, Levinas, the philosopher Levinas talks about this. Um, there's something about an act of violence that doesn't treat someone like a person, it treats someone like an object. And she thinks that the language we use with guns kind of evokes this. Um, so she says, just as the gun is a sublimation, sorry, just as the camera is a sublimation of the gun, to photograph someone is a sublimation, a sublimated murder, a soft murder appropriate to a sad, frightened time. And she says that, you know, the language we use with guns um, sort of convey the same idea. Um, so like um, sexual objectification, 
of women and the objectification of women through lenses is very similar. Um, there's this sort of central fantasy connected with the camera. She calls it kind of like a phallus, um, which um, guns are also kind of phalluses, right? So this language of loading, aiming, shooting a film. Um, she says, a car, uh, like a car, a camera is sold as a predatory weapon, right? It's something that expresses a sort of aggression and violence, control, possession of the world that treats everything as an object. That's how she's describing photography. Okay, so lots of things to worry about there. Um, so when she's talking about the relationship between photography and empathy and sort of trying to create moral impulses in people, that's kind of a sharp turn, right? To move from this sort of sex and fantasy and control and violence to empathy and morality. But that's how um, photography is frequently used, especially photojournalism. Uh, it's to try to get public sympathy for things that are important, trying to make people feel the suffering of other people um, so that you can get public support um, for certain causes. And um, she says that, you know, photographs teach us a visual, uh, a visual code. Uh, photographs alter and enlarge our notions of what is, look, uh, what is worth looking at and what we have a right to observe. They are a grammar and more importantly, an ethics of seeing. So behind a photograph, is an interpretation of that photograph. What does it mean? Why is it important? How does it pull on our heartstrings or our emotions or our minds? What does it say about the world? And all of that has a lot of ethical meaning to it, a lot of ethical implications. So um, this is a photograph of um, Emmett Till from 1955. And this photograph is um, of, uh, it's, they had an open casket, um, uh, funeral for Emmett Till um, because he was beaten by two white men. This was a 14-year-old African-American boy in the 1950s who supposedly flirted with a white woman and was beaten brutally to death where he was disfigured and hardly recognizable. And the mother decided to have an open casket burial so people could see the brutality of it. And there were photographs taken and distributed. And this helped um, this helps uh, people to realize how brutal Jim Crow was and why segregation was such um, a sort of uh, moral affront and why it, you know, um, civil rights movement needed, um, needed to be supported. So there's something about photographs that are meant to give us a sense of urgency for fixing a situation, right? They're meant to sort of employ um, moral rhetoric and help us move towards something better. And I had you read, um, sorry, watch this video on Migrant Mother and the sort of history of it. And I want you, as you're watching it, if you haven't already, to think about the purpose of this photograph, right? This was during the Great Depression. And um, Dorothy Lang, the photographer, was actually hired to take a bunch of photographs of the poor, of migrants who were looking for work and really um, struggling um, to help um, get support for public programs that were meant to relieve um, the suffering of the Depression. And um, it shows you her process of setting this photo up. And I want you to think about whether you were surprised um, there's something about this photograph. It's so famous. You've seen it before, for sure. And there's something about this photograph where it seems so natural, as if this moment was captured and nothing about it is staged. And so I want you to think about the process of creating this photograph and if it's false, if it's not false, if it's telling the truth in some way. And I also want you to think about if it's transcended its specific time and its purpose. Um, how has it become an archetype? So she says that photographs can be very powerful because they bring news to us. They show us unexpected zones of misery, but these cannot make a dent in our opinion unless we have the context and feeling and attitude behind them. So if you just receive a photo, but you know nothing about the source of this image, if there's no sort of feeling or attitude behind it, if you don't have a context for it, photographs are not gonna have any meaning. 
At the same time, when you do have the context, when you know what's happening, and when it's connected to ideas and feelings, they become extremely powerful. So she talks about um, this particular photo of um, this girl. Um, it's called the Terror of War. It's again from Vietnam. And this little girl was, um, this village was accidentally bombed by the South Vietnamese. Um, they accidentally dropped napalm on this innocent village. And this little girl was covered in napalm and it burned off all her clothes. She was covered, 30% of her body was covered in third degree burns. She, you know, has lived in pain the rest of her life. You can actually watch interviews of her. She's still living. Um, and she talks about how awful it was that the worst moment of her life was captured right there, right? This is a terrifying moment. This is extremely painful. This is this is an unspeakably horrible thing, right? To be a child and to be a victim of war in this way. And um, it's an incredibly famous photo. And it also, as Sontag points out, it did more to increase the public revulsion against the war than 100 hours of televised um, barbarities. And so there's something about a still image, this way of capturing a really intense moment that um, is able to have a profound effect on us. Sontag talks about um, our relation to photographs. Um, you know, we've seen so many human atrocities. Um, these are photos of the concentration camp in Dachau. And Sontag talks about, she talks about seeing these images at the age of 12 and feeling like she was never the same after, that they kind of scarred her. They kind of took away some sort of innocence of her childhood and she was never the same after, right? And she's writing this as um, a Jewish American woman. Um, a sort of secular Jew, um, but sh there's an identity there. And there's that first moment of realizing how awful and vicious and cruel the world is that is all captured in these images of all these bodies. And at the same time, we become really sort of um, anesthetized is the word she used, right? We kind of become numb because we've seen so many awful photos. Like I was saying, as I was thinking about what photos to use for this particular um, lecture, it was really hard to choose. There's, um, when I was a child, you know, there were all these photos of the famine in Somalia where you see people just being pure bones and women, you know, a woman who is just bones in a wheelbarrow. Um, and you, um, right, you, we've seen all these photos of, you know, refugee children. So there's so many photos of human suffering. And she says that, you know, they don't necessarily strengthen our consciousness or our ability to be compassionate. It's possible there might be um, a way that our moral sentiment gets actually corrupted because we just become numb to seeing so much suffering. There's something transfixing about these images. And in fact, there's like hideous, um, there's hideous websites out there where people sort of look at these types of photos for pleasure, not to sort of have their moral consciousness raised, but to have um, some sort of um, perverse desire to see pain and suffering be fulfilled. So there's something about the images themselves that don't necessarily help us be moral. And so she says the ethical content of photographs is fragile. And there's a limit to what photographs can do, partly because there's a limit to the knowledge of them. So she says the limit of photographic knowledge in the world is that while it can goad conscience, it can finally never be ethical or political knowledge. It will be knowledge at bargain prices, a semblance of knowledge, a semblance of wisdom. And I chose this photo to kind of point this out because this looks like such a lovely moment. This is like the end of World War II being celebrated Times Square and a young sailor grabs a nurse, right? These are both people who have been working in the war effort in different ways. Um, and everyone's looking around smiling. Um, but if you learn the history of this, she didn't know him, she was just grabbed um, so he's sort of like assaulting her in this moment, and he's celebrating, she's uncomfortable. Um, also, there's, there's so much more you could say about this photo, but there's something, some sort of limit to photographs um, that, you know, they're fragile and the meanings they hold are delicate. 
and this is why she comes back to the idea that, you know, we elevate images and what they can do and the sort of power they have, which is, you know, they are very powerful, but she kind of frames photographs as an addictive consumer product. So this is why she's talking about in Plato's cave. You thought I was never going to get to the title, did you? Right? So Plato's allegory of the cave, which I posted a video of um, for this week. So if you're not familiar with the allegory already, you can watch this short video that will tell you about it. But it has to do with the idea that there's these prisoners in the cave and they're like us. That's what um, Socrates says. He's like, we're like these prisoners because um, from birth they're in chains and all they see are shadows cast on a wall of these people walking by them. And um, they think those appearances are reality because that's all they've ever seen, the shadows on the wall. And they have all these names and ways of talking about it and there's an echo in the cave. And so all of those shadows seem real. And what Socrates is trying to do in this allegory is say that we cannot trust appearances. Our eyes and ears lie to us. He says this in so many different dialogues. We can't trust the way things look to us. We have to investigate further. Appearances are not knowledge. So this is what Sontag's trying to point out is that we are in the cave if we insist that these images are the truth. If photographs give us the truth, then we're stuck looking at something that is false. So she says, humankind lingers unregenerately in Plato's cave, still reveling its age-old habit in mere images of truth. And there's something that's very mesmerizing about images, and that's why it's hard to escape the cave. Um, the images are familiar. They're not very challenging. Um, it's harder to go out in the world and try to make sense of things. And she says, you know, photographs have multiple meanings. And so this is partly why their appearances. Um, she says, you know, we encounter an object of fascination. Um, we have um, the ultimate wisdom we can kind of get from a photograph is to say, there is the surface. Now think or feel into it. What is beyond it? What is the reality that it must be like if it looks this way? So Sontag's trying to say, you know, don't stop at the surface of a photograph. Look at the meaning behind it. Look at the context. Try to get at the history. Try to get the story of it because it's only presenting you with an appearance. It's only presenting you with the surface of something. And she says, photographs which cannot themselves explain anything are inexhaustible invitations to deduction, speculation, and fantasy. So we say, you know, a photo has a thousand, um, uh, says a thousand words. I'm, I'm getting my cliches wrong because I try not to use cliches, right? But we talk about photographs saying a lot, but really it has to do with this work of interpreting what a photograph is doing. And um, we have to kind of be aware of that process. She says that the camera's rendering of reality must always hide more than it discloses, right? So it's not just that it's an appearance, it's an appearance that hides a deeper truth. And I love this um, cartoon, Kelvin and Hobbes, um, where he talks about, you know, people think um, photographs tell the truth, they think cameras tell the truth. And he says that's because they think a camera is like a dispassionate machine that records only facts. But really cameras lie all the time because they select the facts and manipulate the truth. And he gives this example of like setting up his room. So he takes a picture of a, him with it and it looks like his room's really clean when in fact it's a mess. Um, so, right, photographs only show you such a sliver of things, such a particular perspective that you really can't think of it as presenting reality. It's always hiding more. And this is also um, something I want you to think about with how we use social media and the photographs we use. And this is something people are becoming more and more aware of with things like Instagram, where you can make your life look utterly fabulous. You know, put a filter on that. Only show photos of you where you're posing in front of brightly colored walls or where it looks like you're having a picnic in a scenic area or something, right? And you can kind of, you know, present yourself and represent yourself in a very particular way. And there's something we have where we really like that. We really like this participation in the world through photography. She says, needing to have reality confirmed and experience, um, and experience enhanced by photographs is an aesthetic consumerism to which everyone is now addicted, right? Sontag's writing this way before social media, way before Instagram. So I want you to think about how much more intensely true this is. 
Industrial societies turned their citizens into image junkies is the most irresistible form of mental pollution, right? So she is actually making us try to think about why we're so addicted to these photographic images. Is it because of empathy? Is it because of knowledge? Is it because it shows us the world? Well, it does, but it also kind of expresses a sort of mental pollution, a sort of um, being just desiring images for the sake of images, right? This distraction we get through seeing things, right? As you're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling through Instagram. And so um, I wanna suggest that we have some of these sort of image addictions to an even greater degree because images are in our pocket like all the time and we can look at them. And I think people are more and more drawn to images than words now, which means that they're not looking at the context of images. They're not thinking about the background. They're not thinking about the ideas or what um, sort of feelings and truths, what, what is going on in the photographs. They just like the images in a way. And so um, in a way, we're not in Plato's cave anymore. We're now in Plato's rave, right? We're, we're in a much more intense experience of being flooded with images that are very mesmerizing and um, sort of we are, yeah, we're in a rave. Okay, I am very interested in what you have to say about Sontag in um, the discussion boards this week. And um, yes, I will look forward to reading your thoughts. Thank you.